morning, Stonegate. How are you guys? My name's Tyler. We're excited you could be here this morning. We just want to sing this new song with you. So go on, lay your troubles down. Set your feet on solid ground. Peace deep as I have found. I want to follow. So come on, all you weak and weary. Come round now if you can hear me. Poor, sick, and God fearing. I want to follow you. I said, I want to follow you. Leave all your trouble. Leave all your sorrow. Sit down your burden. Come on and follow. So come on, heavy laden. Don't wait for me. Set your burdens down. You set your burdens down. Yeah. Let's clap with us. Leave all your trouble. Leave all your sorrow. Set down your burden. Come on, fire. Yeah. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Clark, one of the guys on staff, and, and I want to be the first to welcome you uh, here to our gathering today. If you, whether you're a longtime uh, attender member here, or whether it's your first time, ultimately, as you make your way in, we, we want you to feel at home. We want you to be, uh, feel part of the family as we really together uh, just stand and, and see the wonders of who Jesus is as we gather around his mighty love towards us. And so, man, just feel at home, feel at ease. If you need anything, we've got an incredible usher team that can help, uh, help direct you, point you in the right direction. Uh, today, we're going to continue on with our summer series, What We Believe. And, and this series is just all about taking the, the truths of theology and marrying them with our hearts so that our lives overflow in a way that's powerfully compelled by God's love and grace. Again, so glad you're here. We're going to dive into the Holy Spirit a little bit later through teaching. But right now, let's corporately together sing unto our great God and King. This morning, 
Let's sing song, this song to our King Jesus as we make most of who he is this morning. Ephesians 2, let's celebrate that we've been made alive in Jesus. And God be rich in mercy, full of love, has made us alive. And though we were dead in sin, because of His grace, we own in Christ. So we will sing to the great God who has made us alive. 
will sing to the great God who has made us alive, Jesus.
this prayer together and as I rise strength of God go before lift me up eyes away eyes of God look upon be my side yeah Christ be all around me, above and below 
Let's pray together. God, we, we pause in the service really just to, again, through prayer, acknowledge that you are who you say you are and that you've done what you've said you've done. And God, as, as I was listening and, 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 and joining in the, the singing, I remembered really Ephesians 2, what inspired made us alive, that, that second song that we sung. It says, God, that because you were rich in mercy and because you loved us so much, even though we were dead, you made us alive. And God, would you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, drive that from our heads into the recesses of our being, God, that we would be people to just not verbally say that, but believe it and then live in response to it, God. Fill us to that end, Jesus, we, we want that, and it's in your name that we pray, amen. All right, all over campus, as you guys can sit, take a seat. Again, my name is Eric Clark. I want to welcome everybody here in Midland, Maine, and to our campus in Odessa, and to our friends and our family over at Stonegate North. I want to give you guys a couple announcements while our ushers are making their way down front in both Stonegate North and here to take our offering. Uh, here's the deal. Oftentimes, uh, announcements might seem a little clunky, but, but there's a deep why behind why we do announcements here at Stonegate Fellowship. And the, the reality is this is a big place. It's easy to attend, but sometimes can be very difficult to belong or to take your next step. And we really believe that every single one of you in this room has a next step with Jesus. Whether you're a first-time guest and you want to get to know more about who we are, or you're a lifetime a Stonegate attender and have yet to uh, really engage in, in a group or in a class or to serve here. And the best way to do that is to take the, uh, the Start Here card. Here in this room, it's in the seat back in front of you. At our, at our other venues, it's in the, uh, the foyer at the info desk. And we want you to fill out both sides and, and let us know how we can best take the baton and help you connect to the life of this place. Again, we don't want you just to attend, but we want you to belong here among us. So that's the first announcement. The second thing is, is that we have some changes to our element service that are right on the horizon. So Sunday, August 7th is a Sunday night. Starting at 5 o'clock, we are going to have food trucks, jumpers, yard games, and everything out here on our corner. Okay, we're doing this as a kind of a, a pre-elements family time where you can come eat from food trucks, have fun as a family. And then uh, as it gets a little bit cooler, around 6.15, 6.30 or so, we're going to begin worship and baptisms out, outside, just out, outside these front doors. And we're going to celebrate what God has done through our camps and through our baptism classes that went on uh, this morning as, as we get to see face-to-face -face the lives transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ. Again, that's Sunday, August 7th. Food trucks start at 5 uh, baptism and worship start around 6, 15, 6, 30. And then after all that's done, around 8, 8, 30, we're going to have a family movie out on the lawn, a big giant screen. And then that will begin for us a change in element services moving from Wednesday to the first Sunday night every month. The last thing I have for you at all of our campuses, all of our venues, is in this series, What We Believe, you heard me if you were in this room uh, when I welcomed you guys, that we don't want to just know a bunch of theological truths, but we want so much so that the truths of Jesus to impact our hearts, that then our lives live differently in the everyday stuff of life, in our neighborhoods, the way we work, the way we go out to location, the way we raise kids. And so we've, we've created a resource page for you, stonegatefellowship.com forward slash what we believe. We would love to continue the conversation and equip you through that website. So please go there during the week and... Um, all right, so here we go. We're going to transition into uh, our next kind of week in the What We Believe series with Patrick talking a little bit more about the Holy Spirit. Well, good morning. It's good to have you back this week. And um, find your way to Acts chapter 1. That's where we're going to get started uh, here this morning as we, as Eric said, keep pressing into this issue of the Holy Spirit. It's a really exciting time around here because if you're keeping track, we're 49 days away from the beginning of college football season. So um, that's, that's the season we know the Lord has promised us he won't come back. And so, uh, and I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, that is so offensive. Um, 
If you're a guest with us, if you come back during football season, it's a lot of fun around here. So great to have you, and I'm excited about continuing to teach about this, this person of the Holy Spirit. I want to make sure that as, as we go through this, you and I each understand how critically important it is that we capture the truth of the scriptures about who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. You see, many of us have grown up environment, in environments where we haven't just been methodically taught through the scriptures about the Holy Spirit, and, and therefore, because of that, uh, we're led off of cliffs and in different directions of extremes or, or even lack of extremes, and we really have never understood this truth of the Holy Spirit, and, and how that affects many of us is there are many in this room, myself included, who perhaps you came to Jesus uh, at an early age. And I don't care what environment that was, whether, what kind of church it was as far as denominational or whatever it was or, or a camp. But there are many in this room who have an experience of praying in some way, shape, or form to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. You looked up to heaven, you looked down and prayed. You may, you may have cried during that time. It might have been emotional. It might have been non-emotional. It might have been very methodical or whatever. And, and what you were doing was asking Jesus to save you. As real as real gets. Romans chapter 10 says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and at that moment, you believed that you were saved. But what happened for many of us is all we knew was Jesus saved us from hell and from now on, we're going to try not to sin. It's going to be sin management and behavior modification. And if I don't mess up, it's going to be good. And if I do mess up, I'll go to church. And I, want to, I know I'm supposed to get in Bible studies and, and I ought to be involved in things like that. And we come and we go and we wish and we wash and we're up and we're down. Now, what happens is we oftentimes then will do something. And if you grew up in a very conservative environment, maybe not even a conservative environment, what you end up doing is as you get older, you have some doubts creep in. And you kind of wonder, I don't, you know, I don't know if that, if that was real. I don't know if that took when I was you know, five, six, seven. So you either get re-saved, which is unbiblical, or you do what we did in the church I grew up in, because you knew you were saved, but what you needed to do was you needed to recommit your life. Anybody grow up in a church where everybody recommitted? Anybody do that? You go to camp, you go to camp. And if the preacher couldn't get you to get saved, he could at least make you feel like such a sorry loser, you'd recommit your life. And, and so that's what you come down front, I'm just a loser, and you'd pray. And then we'd go back to church and we'd say, Patrick has recommitted his life to Jesus. And now here's, here's the problem. What's happened is we have never fully understood what happens at the moment of salvation. You see, so much more happens than what we've been taught. And here's what we're traditionally taught. We are traditionally taught that when we get saved, Jesus Christ comes into our heart. But what's interesting about that is as you go through the scriptures, you are barely going to be able to find one, if maybe two passages that speak about Jesus in the heart. But what we do read about is how Jesus, because of what he's done, remember what he's done, he has lived, died, been buried, and resurrected, sits at the right hand of the Father, forever interceding for us. And what he does at salvation, Romans 10 tells us, you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The rest of the scriptures we'll look at over the next couple of weeks tell us he gives us his spirit. As a matter of fact, he even told us in the passages I read you last week, he said, it's good that I go away from you, because if I, do not, if I do not go away from you, then I cannot send you the person you need, which is the Holy Spirit. And when he sends his Holy Spirit to you, the Bible says he seals you in his spirit, by his spirit, with his spirit. And because we've not been taught the immensity of this and the wonder of this, we think we lose Jesus and need to get him back when the reality is when we call on Jesus, we get all the Jesus we'll ever need, but we have yet to learn how to live out of the spirit of Christ that he has given us. And so what we have to do is we have to keep pressing into a methodical walk through the scriptures to understand where the spirit has come from, how the spirit has arrived, and what that means for our lives. Therefore, Acts chapter 1. Okay, I told you to go to Acts chapter 1, and let me get there, and I'll catch up with you, and we'll get going. going to be fairly academic here this morning. Let me tell you how the service is going to end for Odessa, for North. It's probably going to end like slamming on the brakes, okay? So 
Just be ready for that. And, and I'll say, let's pray. And if you need someone to meet with you and pray with you after the service, there'll be people down here at the front or in the prayer room. But we're just, we're just going through it, okay? If you didn't like school, you're not going to like this morning. Um, but we'll try to make it better than school was, okay? So Acts chapter 1, let me bring you up to speed as to where we are, okay? And also remember, if you're reading the Bible and you're studying the Bible, when you read the book of Acts, it's probably a good idea to read the book of Luke first, okay? Because Luke and Acts were more than likely written by Dr. Luke, and so they kind of go together. They tell the story real well together. Where Luke finishes off, Acts kind of picks up. Now, where did the story leave off? You'll remember the story. Jesus has lived his life. He's died the death. He's hung from the cross. He has been buried. He has been resurrected. He is appearing to his followers. And remember Matthew, he said, go into all the world and make disciples or all the nations. Now we're getting to Acts chapter 1, okay? And Luke is picking up, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 4, okay? And for the rest of the morning, we will go right, all right? So just, or if you're swiping, we're going to, I don't know what you'll do. So chapter 4, and, and while staying with them, he, that is Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Now this is a reference he says, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water. Make sure you understand this word baptism. It's more than just a Duncan term, okay? It is, it is, it is, actually it is kind of a dunking term. So if you had a donut, like, like a, you know, I know a lot of you eat them out there and I'm afraid if we ever didn't serve donuts, it'd be a bad, like we'd lose our entire church. But anyways, if you take, if you take a donut and you, you baptize it in chocolate or sugar, you cover it and you change it. And, and it, that word baptism is more than just a dunking in water term. It's also a term used in the clothing industry way back in that day, which meant to baptize something in an ink or a dye and it changes it, okay? So it's, it's got a transformative aspect to, its, to it as well, more than just a church aspect. So John baptized or immersed you with water, but you will be immersed in, baptized in, covered in, filled with, changed by the Holy Spirit not many days from now. All right, now up to that time, I told you this last week, the disciples, when they thought of the Holy Spirit, the only reference point they had was New Te Old Testament stories about the Holy Spirit coming upon people, rarely in two. Now that's all changing. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon and more than upon going to inhabit followers of Jesus. And you'll see that as we go. But we've got to pick up what's happening here or you'll read the book of Acts um, wrongly. Because if you build theology out of the book of Acts without understanding the history of the book of Acts, you'll build your theology incorrectly. All right, let's keep going. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, they're talking to Jesus, so Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Why did they ask that question? They were looking for a coming Jewish king who would wipe out their enemies and they could just live forever with him, okay? They wanted Jesus to do away with their enemies so they could be who they were and wanted to be without anybody else around. And this is what Jesus says to them, an interesting word perhaps for even us today. Jesus says, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Let me put that in, in today's language. I know things are going crazy in the world, and you might be wondering when the end is going to be. But let me tell you, quit worrying about the end and start understanding what it means to live in the Spirit and be an influence where you are today. So this is what he says. But you will receive power. Now that word power, you've probably heard this before, is where we get our word dynamite, okay? And it carries with it more than just an idea of blowing up everything. You see... Dynamite, and if you, I remember one time I worked for a guy when I was in high school who, he was an oil man, and I don't think you're all like this here in oil, but um, he wanted us to put a pool in his backyard, and so he taught us how to use dynamite. <laughs> Great day. So anyways, uh, you know, dynamite is dynamite because internally it possesses something powerful, and that's that word that's used, power, that word is an internal, um, what's the right word for you to understand it, just maybe an inherent or inherited source of power that lives within you. So you will receive a given, an inherited, powerful presence. Okay, let's keep reading. You're going um, to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses just means storytellers. You're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now it's very important you pay attention and I pay attention to what he says right there. The Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you and the reason he says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world is because he's telling his Jewish followers that the salvation Jesus brought and the Holy Spirit he will send will be for all people. And it's gonna start in Jerusalem, and you're gonna see this in a minute. It's gonna spread to Judea, which is, it'd be like saying it's gonna start in Midland, then it's gonna go to the Permian Basin, or it's gonna start in Odessa and go to the Permian Basin, then it's gonna go to the state of Texas, then it's gonna go to the rest of the world, or the rest of the nation, and then the rest of the world. And those Jewish people who are listening, when he says the gospel is going to spread even to Samaritans, that's the enemy. That's racial conflict right there. But he's saying this is going to happen when the Holy Spirit arrives. So he's showing us what's going to happen. Well, the reason I'm telling you that is because as we travel through the book of Acts and we get about halfway through it, what you're going to see is there's a sign that oftentimes shows up that indicates the gospel has moved to people other than just Jewish people, all right? We got Acts chapter one, go to Acts chapter two, okay? Right next chapter, right before this, Jesus has blessed the disciples and he has ascended to the Father in heaven. Now, I don't know what that ascension looked like, if he just evaporated, but it just, it tells us he went to be with the Father, okay? And we know that he told us, if I'm leaving, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, right? We've read that. Go to chapter two. So we'll begin reading in verse one. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. They were together in one place because they were afraid, okay? They had basically been a part of a movement that was usurping Roman authority, so they're a little terrified here. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now, that doesn't mean the doors all blew off. It just, Luke is telling you that something happened in the room it sounded like a mighty rushing wind. If, if you have lived in Oklahoma or Kansas, especially in that area, and you've lived through tornadoes, you've heard people say this, it sounded like a freight train. And nobody goes, do you mean a freight train went through your house? They go, no, no, no. I'm just telling you that's what it sounded like. And Luke is telling us something happened in that room, sounded like a powerful rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where everybody was sitting. Said another way, something showed up and the room changed. You know what that's like. You know how you can be in a room and, and just, you know, somebody show, up, <laughs> somebody show up and you're like, oh, the room just changed. Or it can be positive. Oh, the room just changed. But anyways, we, I'm glad that baby agreed. So verse three, <laughs> watch what happens. And when this happens, verse three, and divided tongues of fire appeared to all of them and rested on each of them. Luke is describing to us what he sees. And this is the only time this happens. But something appears, it, it looks like just flames of some sort, okay? And everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody there, and this is important because you're gonna see something about everybody. And let me pause for a minute to remind you of what Jesus said. In Matthew 28, he said, you should be my witnesses and you shall go and share the gospel and go unto all the nations, and when, the, when Jesus said you're to go to all the nations, he uses a word that in the Greek language, I'm not saying that because I'm smart, I just know where to find the answer. It's a Greek word that means ethnic groups. So for instance, it, it's not just Europeans, it's, it's not just Americans, it's not just Canadians, it's not just Africans. It means people who belong to specific groups that even have very specific languages and dialects. So when I've been in Africa doing work, you can travel from one area to the other, and they'd be very close, but you will encounter different nations, like Austin Powers, nations. Anyways, I know, you're like, did he watch that movie? Yes, hilarious. So anyways, it, when, what I'm talking about is I can travel within Africa to different groups, and they're different ethnic groups, and that's what he would use for the word nations. It's very important for what's happening here, so let's keep going. And everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak and that just means in a tongue, and when it says they began to speak in tongues, they were speaking in a language, okay? Not just gibberish, 
They were literally speaking in a language. In fact, it says they began to speak in other tongues. And that word that's used for tongues there is the same phrase you would use if you met somebody. Like I have some friends here that are Chinese Americans, okay? And they speak Chinese and they speak English. And if we've traveled together, they communicate best in their native tongue. Okay, you got it? You got you with me? Okay, so let's, and so they all began to speak in a tongue. It's very important. And as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I wrote this in my Bible, so I wanted, because I always had it with me. When the writer uses the word utterance, let me define that for you. It's enunciating plainly and speaking solemn, weighty sayings. The reason that's important, let me read that again. It's enunciating plainly and solemn, weighty sayings. The reason that's important is because Luke is telling you that everybody begins speaking very plainly. Now, now let's keep reading and see what happens, okay? So verse five. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. And now watch this. And devout men from every nation under heaven. In other words, people had gathered in Jerusalem for a very important season. And when it says men from every nation, I just told you what that word nation means. People from all over everywhere in different ethnic groups. Keep reading with me. And at this sound, remember the, the, the sound of a rushing wind, the multitude gathered together and they were bewildered. In other words, they couldn't quite understand what was happening because each person, watch this, each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Let me keep reading. And they were amazed and astonished and they said, are not all these people speaking Galileans? That, that'd be like if um, you and I were all you know, out and, and people, some conference was going on here in, in the Permian Basin and we decided to go to Swinson's and have ice cream and, and we're all hanging out and there's people from this conference who've shown up from all over the world and in a moment, all of a sudden, we all just start breaking out and speaking different languages. And all these people who have traveled here are going, wait a minute, they're speaking in my language and I haven't heard the word y'all yet. And, and they would be like, how's that happening? This is what's happening here, watch this. They were amazed and astonished and they said, aren't all these people speaking Galileans? Because those people would say, aren't these all Texans? Verse eight, and how is it that we hear each one of us in our own native language? And then it's gonna describe to you the people that are there. Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, and he goes on and lists others. Verse 11, let's just pick up. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And everyone was amazed and even perplexed, and they said to each other, what does this mean? And the rest of them said they must all be drunk. Now, what's important for you to understand is to see Jesus already said, I'm going to do a mighty work and I'm going to send my spirit and my work is for all nations. By the work of God, he gathers the nations there and he blows in with the Holy Spirit and the gospel begins to be preached in a way that everyone hears it and even the people preaching weren't prepared to preach in the tongue they're speaking in. But let's keep going. Acts chapter two. Now why am I so methodically taking you through this? Because what we're leading to is showing you that when God has sent his Holy Spirit, or when he sends his Holy Spirit to you, he sends his Holy Spirit in you, saves you, and seals you. But what you read in the book of Acts is how the Holy Spirit arrives, not what the Holy Spirit does in our lives today. But uh, I'll clarify that in some weeks ahead, so stay with us. So let's keep going. Uh, let's go to verse, um, let's see. How about verse 37? Verse 37 of chapter 2. Stay in chapter 2 and go to verse 37. So when they heard this, by the way, all this happened, and then Peter preaches a message, okay? You remember Peter denied the Lord three times, went off to go fish, Jesus found him, and said, hey, I still have a, a plan for you. So now he's preaching, and in verse 37, it says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What did they hear? Peter had preached a message, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? What shall we do? And in verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Let me, let me just keep reading that. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And then verse 41 tells you, those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 people in one day. Now what's important for you to see there? Very important for you to see that when these people get saved, Peter says, repent and be baptized. And then he says, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Nothing crazy going on. Nobody's speaking in different languages. They're all speaking the same language. Therefore, there's no need for it. But these people receive the Holy Spirit when they get saved. Now, let's keep going. Let's keep moving, okay? Go to Acts chapter 4. Don't have to go very far. Acts chapter 4, and let's go all the way to verse 31. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Peter and John are traveling around, and the... Holy Spirit has arrived in Jerusalem, and it's going to continue its spread. We get to chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. So whether that means a literal shaking, or there was a shaking of the soul, I, it probably was some type of physical shaking. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So here again, and this is where you have to be careful. God changes lives, and he consistently and always, always and consistently supplies his Holy Spirit. And oftentimes we try to put him in theological boxes, ignoring the reality of what's happening in Acts, which is teaching us the Holy Spirit arrives inside of us. Because in verse 31, again, they pray, the place shakes, everybody's filled with the Holy Spirit, and they just keep preaching the word of God. But you don't see anything happening as far as languages because it's now among a people who speak the same. But let's keep going, okay? Are you with me? Is everybody good? Okay, I know it's kind of like statistics class. So let's go to Acts. We go to Acts chapter 5. We're going to skip it. Although there's a very important story in there about a husband and wife who made some money and didn't give an appropriate amount to the church, and so the Holy Spirit killed them. So we'll take an offering when this is over, okay? And so you keep going, and then you're going to skip chapter 6, there's a story in chapter 6 about appointing some men to serve some people. Some people would say it's the first deacons. I'm not sure that's really correct. But anyways, then you're going to get to Acts chapter 7. A guy named Stephen is preaching a message. Something happens to him at the end of his message that some of you probably wish would happen to me. He gets stoned. Now, let me clarify that because some of you may be from Colorado. And, and you may think, cool. Cool. Like the dude preaches and gets stoned. No, not yet. So anyways, I mean, you're like, I can't believe he said that. But anyways, it's just want to clarify because I know there's sometimes people who are like, I knew the Bible had weed in it. So it's, it's not that. It's, it's rocks. So anyways, so we got to go to Acts chapter 8. Okay, remember Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the rest of the world. So we're watching a, prog a progression, right? We're watching a progression. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we entered, we're introduced to this guy named Saul. You're going to know him as Paul later. And verse 1 says, and Saul approved of the execution, the execution of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions, watch this, of Judea and Samaria. It's important you also see except the apostles because the apostles stay in Jerusalem and they'll come up a little bit later. A, a, a kind of a practical note when you see this, it is important for you and I, regardless of where you get your news, if you get it from CNN or Fox News or the BBC or whatever extreme network or whatever you, however you get your news and you listen to what's happening in our world, the world related to immigration and related to the issue of refugees. Because what you're reading about right here is the second large group of refugees in the Bible. The first massive group of refugees in the Bible were called the children of Israel. The second group of refugees are Jews who know Jesus, who are being scattered for a purpose. The reason that's so important is I can tell you right now that in a world that looks like it's going crazy, with a refugee crisis that scares many of us, the very refugee crisis that scares many of us is a crisis being used by the Lord to drive people to places that have been preparing as followers of Jesus to meet these refugees to preach the gospel to them. 
So be very careful about how you interpret your news. That's all I'm gonna say about that as um, we move on. Verse two, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, going in house after house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Now, go to chapter eight, we're in chapter eight, and go over to verse 14, okay? Chapter eight, verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem, remember I told you a group of them stayed in Jerusalem, they heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, okay? That, it, they couldn't believe it. There was a huge, huge racial tension between Jews and Samaritans. They hated each other, hated each other. That's why Jesus told the story about the good Samaritan, because he was kind of getting in the face of his fellow countrymen. Now, verse 15 says, Peter and John came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he, that is the Holy Spirit, had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, I mean, verse 17, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. End of story. Again, we see this arrival of the Holy Spirit entering into people's lives, but different than Acts chapter two, but the same thing happening. And what's happening? The gospel is moving into the rest of the world and the Holy Spirit arrives. So we gotta keep moving. So go to chapter nine, okay? Go to chapter nine. And by the time you get to chapter nine, Saul was on a trip on the road to Damascus. Some of you know this story. Jesus knocks him over, says, I'm taking your life. I want you to be a witness for me. Saul gets saved, okay? And he's blinded for a moment. And the Holy Spirit, God, tells a man named Ananias that he's supposed to go see Saul. It's kind of funny because Ananias goes, uh, Lord, have you heard that he's killing people like me? And the Holy Spirit says, but I have chosen him. What would you do if God changed your enemy? And yet he does. And so we see in chapter 9, let me go ahead and move you on ahead to verse 14. And here he has authority from chief priests to bind and all who call on him name, but on his name, but the Lord said to him, go, he is a chosen instrument of mine. He's going to carry my name before the Gentiles. I'll show him how much he must suffer. Now verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house. Imagine how scared he was, man. He thought he was probably being set up. This guy named Saul, he's a persecutor of the church. He's already had so many people committed to death, so on and so forth. But he walks in and he lays his hands on Saul. And he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled by the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and he got up and he was baptized and he took food and he was strengthened. End of story. Saul comes to Jesus. Now remember, Saul or Paul is Jewish, okay? And so and here we have another Jewish person receiving salvation and the Holy Spirit arriving on his life. Now move over to Acts chapter 10, okay? Go to Acts chapter 10. So now Christians have been persecuted. They've been spread out. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the rest of the world. Now the gospel is going to move literally to other nations, so to speak, big nations like Rome, okay? And when you get to chapter 10, and I'm going to try to tell you the story and narrow it down, Peter is real involved in this deal. Peter is sleeping, and he has a dream. He has a vision. Remember, Peter is a devout Jew, which means he doesn't eat pork rinds, okay, or anything like that. And so he's having this dream, and in the dream, it's like this tablecloth comes down in the dream, and it's filled with all kinds of things they're not supposed to eat, okay? And, and so like no rice, peppered bacon, all this kind of stuff is coming down, and the Lord says in the dream, he says, Peter, I want you to eat this stuff. And Peter three times says to the Lord, not going to do it. Nothing like that has ever touched my lips ever three times. He's like, not going to do it. And so he does that to the Lord. All right. And the Lord says, what I have made clean, don't you call dirty. It'd be like, let me give you an example. For instance, when, when my youngest son said, dad, I'm going to Texas A&M. I said, there is nothing clean that has come out of there. 
And the Lord said, but what I have changed, you will obey. So he's enrolled and God does miracles. But let me, let me, let me show you something here. So watch. Go to chapter 10, verse 44. Okay, watch this. While Peter was still saying these things. So here's what, what happens is the Lord is telling Peter to go see a bunch of Italians. Okay? And, and they're under the household of a guy named Cornelius, okay? It's like the godfather. So he says, I want you to go see, I'm trying to give you things that'll stay in your head. So he says, I want you to go see Vito Corleone, okay? And, I, and, and I'm gonna save him. And Peter says, no. And he says, yes, yes, you will. And so he goes to see Vito. And in verse 44, it says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. He's preaching a message, the gospel. And the believers from among the circumcised, Peter took some Jewish people with him to witness this, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. How'd we start this whole conversation? The gospel is moving to the rest of the world and God is showing that the gospel is for all people, even Vito. And so you get to verse 46. And they were hearing them speaking in tongues, same words we used in chapter two, and extolling God. And then God declared, or Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just like we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to remain for some days. Turn to chapter 11, okay, go to chapter 11. In chapter 11, Peter has been called back to Jerusalem. Remember I showed you earlier the Jews were scattered except the apostles who stayed in Jerusalem. So it's kind of this club that's kind of running the thing, things for a while and they've heard about what happened to the Italians and they're wondering what happened. So they call Peter in and he tells the story. Go to verse 15. As I began to speak, he's retelling the story, okay? So he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just like he did us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. Look at this coming full circle. I remember the word of the Lord when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized by and with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? And when they heard this thing, they fell silent and they glorified God, critical phrase here, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance to life. And we ought to be thankful for that because about 98% of us in this room are Gentiles that the Holy Spirit comes to and we are being told that story. Okay, uh, three minutes, one more passage, okay? And then we'll just, like I told you, just gonna hit the brakes and then Lord willing and the creek don't rise, we'll come back next week. So you're gonna skip chapter 13. It's another movement of God into a place called Antioch. Skip chapter 14 and go to verse, or chapter 15, okay? Chapter 15, remember the, the, the clan in Jerusalem? They're still trying to figure out how in the world the gospel is moving. And so now Paul and Barnabas, so they're gonna show up and tell their story. And in chapter 15, find your way to verse six. Chapter 15, verse six. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider the matter. What's the matter? The matter is there are Gentiles getting saved everywhere now, and they may not be living life the way we live life. They're different than us. Isn't that kind of crazy? So the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just like he did to us. Let me put that in normal words. You know that the Lord said he's gonna bring the gospel to the rest of the world, not just Jews. And he did exactly to them what he's done to us. Verse eight. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just like he did to us, verse nine, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. You see, all the way up to this point, in, in chapter 15 is where we pretty much see the end of all this happening and these things around the Holy Spirit because it has been declared that the gospel has arrived to all nations. We will only see 
The Holy Spirit involved in this movement again in chapter 16 and in chapter 19. And by the time we're done with chapter 19, from then on, the establishment has been set, the precedent has been set, that when people call on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit arrives in their lives, and we'll see next week and the week after that, that he arrives at salvation, seals us at salvation, and sanctifies us for the rest of our lives. But up till now, class is over, okay? So you can close your notebook, and hopefully we can come together next week. Let's pray together. I told you it'd just be like a rapid stop, so um, we're done. Let's pray, and hope you have a good afternoon. Father, thank you for letting us gather and study your word. Thank you that it is inspired and not my words, and so may we continue to reflect back on what your word teaches us about your Holy Spirit uh, that you seal us with, whom you seal us with in salvation. Ask for your grace and mercy and peace as we go through this today. And thanks again for letting us gather. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hopefully we'll see you next week and have a great one.